Good morning. I am Dr. Anil Bhatt and I am honored and privileged to have here with me Dr. K. R. Balakrishna. Dr. K. R. Balakrishna is the pioneer, the doyen of cardiac transplant surgery in India, not only in India, in Southeast Asia. And he today is running one of the most consistent and uh, a very volume based, high volume center for cardiac transplant in the country, cardiac and lung transplant in the country. And this is equally apt that we are discussing this subject on today, which is the 150th anniversary of BAPU. And this foundation for this organization has been built on a supreme act of kindness on all the patient and the family who have made organ donor, organ transplant a success. Dr. K. R. Balakrishnan, let me begin by asking you to lead us through your journey in India and what is more relevant is what is it that in Tamil Nadu today, what is it that is setting out Tamil Nadu as a leader in transplants in the country. So we would like you to have an opinion as to how exactly were the challenges that you faced in bringing up a transplant program in the country and in particular the success story of Tamil Nadu in this field. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, as you know the um, modern era of heart transplantation in India started in 1994 uh, after the parliament passed a law certifying brain death as a legal entity. And soon thereafter, uh, Professor Venugopal in the All India Institute did the first transplant, followed by Dr. Cherin and Girinav in Chennai. And uh, we did our first transplant in 1996, which was the fourth in India at the time. But for the next 15 years or 17 years, the progress was very slow. Uh, I think only a total of about 30 transplants had been done till 2012. That was because uh, when you had a donor, you didn't have a recipient. When you had a recipient, uh, there was no donor uh, because there was no organized organ distribution system. And uh, so overall, the um, scenario was pretty bleak. Around the year 2009, uh, there was a major scandal involving a living donor kidney transplant involving a nephrologist from Tamil Nadu. And the chief minister of the state at the time, Madam Jailalitha, uh, felt that it was an insult to the state as well. And uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a typical sterling example of what's possible with government, good government intent and will and good bureaucracy, they set up um, a system of uh, organ allocation and organ uh, awareness program in the state uh, where uh, a set of rules were laid down and, uh, and the ground rules for organ distribution was between public and private hospitals was laid down with the transparent waiting list and uh, transparent allocation policies. At the same time, with the help of um, non-governmental organization, uh, especially Mohan Foundation, grief counselors were positioned in public hospitals and trained grief counselors in private hospitals so that the potential donors could be counseled <coughs> about organ donation. And this resulted in a steady increase in uh, the availability of donor organs. And uh, we started our program in a serious way in 2012. <coughs> in the year 2014, we had a young girl from Bombay who came down for a transplant. And um, the <coughs> for some reason, uh, the, the transfer of the heart from a hospital through a crowded city using a police escort caught the attention of the press. And that received wide media attention. And uh, that, led, that positive story led to a sudden spurt in organ donation. And it, uh, Chennai city alone 
<coughs> reached an organ donation rate of close to 15 per million, which is more than West Germany. So as a consequence, our transplant numbers grow substantially. And once you have a sizable number of patients out in the community who have done well, it creates a positive buzz and that's how the whole program started and then other states followed. And uh, from a very modest beginning in 2012, we now are doing close to 250 transplants a year in this country. That's uh, nice to hear that. Uh, let's come, coming to a little more of the specifics, in your experience at your center, since you have very large volumes, what's your recipient uh, age that you have? Age is always a mm -hmm. relative thing. And also, uh, the West, as you know, is facing the problem of a transiting age in the donors because their the road traffic accidents have gone down. and so with the consequence of donors abroad tend to be a little older with coexisting comorbid medical conditions. What's the Indian experience, the donors okay. and the recipient, the age and okay. how do you decide the, the cutoff points? In our unit, both the pediatric and adult transplants are done by the same team. So the youngest uh, we have done a transplant is six months and the oldest is 82. Uh, that might seem a little surprising because in a lot of Western countries, they put an age limit beyond which the patients don't get an organ. Those are in, in systems where the state distributes the organs and the state funds the transplantation. So they take the view that they would like to spend money only on those who have productive lives ahead of them. So they arbitrarily decide the 55 or 60 beyond which they will not give an organ. Um, that has its issues and there have been uh, people who have been um, unsatisfied with that arrangement even in the Western countries because uh, 60 is old or young depending upon the age at which you are looking at that age. Uh, when we are close to 60, we don't think 60 is old. And I also know that there have been a lot of resentment in those very countries because you pay your taxes all your life, and when it comes to your turn to receive an organ, you're told that you're too old. So I mean, that doesn't seem fair. But in any case, those kind of arguments don't hold true in this country because uh, the state has very little to do with funding anything. So if a recipient is available uh, and the, the, uh, there's no legal uh, restriction on the age at which a patient can receive an organ at this point in time, so the, if you are able to do an aortic valve replacement at the age of 80 or a traveler uh, and they are able to live for five years, why should you deny a patient an organ, especially if the organ is also from an older patient which would otherwise not be used. So the oldest transplant we have done is 82 and he's now alive and well five years down the line and living a very active life. He's a professional Mirudangam player, you know, the, the one we use for Indian, South Indian classical music. So, uh, coming to the age of the donor, it is true that majority of Indian donors are young road traffic accident victims, uh, though we do get older patients and as a consequence, the percentage of hearts which are usable and which can stand, withstand longer ischemic times is much higher in this country. But curiously, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu in the last couple of years, there has been a very drastic fall in accident rates. Uh, because of a lot of steps the state government has undertaken, uh, up to 30 to 40 percent drop. And as a consequence, increasingly now our local donors are older and less likely to be from road traffic accident and more likely to be from CVS and strokes. So we are already seeing a demographic shift in the donor population. That is interesting from a cardiac perspective and being a cardiologist, uh, I would like to know or the cardiology community also would like to know that once you get into hearts which are older, the donor hearts with comorbidity, how do you make an assessment of the condition of the donor heart? Because even considering a road traffic accident victim being a donor, oftentimes there have been managed in a way which might have affected the heart detrimentally. Too many inotropes and patient may have been in shock at that time. So when you go to harvest an organ like the heart, tell me what goes through your mind 
because after all a patient, the recipient, it's a one time procedure sure. for him, unlike a renal transplant where he has a dialysis to fall back on. So how do you assess the suitability of a borderline donor heart? Good question. See, um, <clears throat> our assessment is done by a trained cardiac anesthesiologist. For a start, we, we don't have the luxury of a cardiologist always being around to assess a donor organ because donor organs come typically at night. And we are very often come in cities which are far away from where we are. Today, uh, in an average month, we probably do eight to nine transplants, and which means flying across the country from uh, going up to Nagpur or sometimes to Delhi or Trivandrum or Bangalore or Hyderabad. Some nights we give we get three donor calls, four donor calls, so four different teams are flying out. So we don't have uh, people who can assess. So assessment is done by trained cardiac anesthesiologists who, who carry with uh, them uh, esophageal probe because a lot of these patients are road traffic accident victims and they, know, they don't necessarily have a good transthoracic window for us to be able to see the heart. And uh, <coughs> Uh, the assessment is to a large extent done on the basis of echocardiogram and uh, if in doubt we sometimes float a PA catheter and measure pressure. And geography um, even in patients over the age of 50 is virtually impossible except in a few hospitals in big cities where angiographic facilities are available because a lot of these donor uh, hospitals <coughs> don't necessarily have a cath lab and even if <coughs> they had a cath lab <coughs> the question comes of who's going to pay for the angiogram. The kidney people often don't like a dye to be injected because it affects kidney function. So um, our assessment of donor coronary artery disease is palpation, which is very crude. So we've had instances where in the post-transplant biopsy and angiogram, we do a, a, at the end of, before the discharge of the patient, we do a cardiac biopsy along with the donor angi angiogram of the, of the uh, new heart. And then we do this every year and more frequently indicated. So we have come across instances of donor coronary artery disease, even in relatively young donors of 35, because India has a high incidence. Of, so we had a few patients who ended up getting stents, and one patient getting stents a couple of times, and then a coronary bypass graft as well. Sticking to donor heart, since the quality of the donor heart or the health of the donor heart is so important. From a cardiology perspective, echo would be a very poor overall marker, especially if including <coughs> transesophageal echo to a <coughs> right ventricle because oftentimes there's a concussion injury on in the chest uh, for which uh, the right ventricle <coughs> is notoriously difficult to assess in a sick patient. So I, I see the point of the problems in assessing a donor heart. The other thing then therefore we bring come to is a recipient. Your indications today for transplant <coughs> as we were hearing in the conference, especially the high volume centers, a good proportion of your patients are acutely ill with the intermac 1, 2, 3 classes. So is your approach different in those patients? <coughs> yeah, sure. The um, acceptance of a given donor heart is also dictated by recipient condition. So if you have a recipient on <coughs> say ECMO or severe biventricular failure <coughs> on inotropes <coughs> with rising creatinine, you are much more likely to accept a borderline organ than if a recipient were to be walking around intermax 6. So <clears throat> eventually, it's risk-benefit assessment of an individual situation. I was hearing the topics over here, and as a cardiologist, I noted one thing running common in most slides is that we need to increase awareness among the cardiologists, which came as a surprise to me. Would you like to tell me from a surgeon's perspective <clears throat> what is lacking or what needs What's, to be done uh, what, more, what, is, uh, what needs to be more what done is, more from other cardiologists. 
<laughs> if you look at renal transplant, <coughs> it is essentially driven by nephrologists. And the surgeons are called upon to just stitch the new kidney in. It's basically a nephrologist domain. And uh, that's why the number of renal transplants in this country are very huge. The waiting list for kidney transplants in our state is around 6,000. The waiting list for liver transplants is around 550. The waiting list for heart is 50. I don't think you will, uh, <coughs> anyone can say that the incidence of heart disease or heart failure is less than liver failure or kidney failure or even the affordability. Uh, clearly, the involvement of uh, Indian cardiologists in end stage heart failure, <coughs> either coming for a transplant or an LVAD, is considerably less than the involvement of nephrologists and hepatologists in their respective organ failures. <coughs> you could debate on the reasons for that. Uh, it's a complex subject. Um, the, it's also likely that um, cardiologists are so busy with their angioplasties and other, so many other procedures that they may or may not <coughs> find this a uh, suitably uh, interesting specialty to pursue. Are there, amongst the great <coughs> tragedies in the Indian health system, and there, is, there are several of them, one of them is the uh, collapse of the public health system. All these procedures should ideally be done in university yeah. hospitals. Uh, and this might seem a little odd coming from both of us who are working in private hospitals. Nevertheless, I think one of the great tragedies in India is this is not being done in every state, the, the leading university hospital should be having these programs and they should be free and they should be high volume and they should be run academically. That's the future. Uh, unfortunately, that's not happened. As a consequence, uh, the, the students who are young, uh, including postgraduates, are not being exposed to what is possible. So they only practice what they have learned. So this is a tragedy and I hope at some point in time we are able to address and it. And I also hope that I think with uh, people like you, with your stature today, I think a time is going should come where an organ which comes for free, the corporate hospital should at least do it at cost. Because oh, yes. you know, uh -huh. the doctors have not paid a fortune anyway. So I think the corporate hospital should take it as a responsibility that an organ coming free should be handled at a no profit basis at least. So that will cut down the cost. See, you think uh, so? cost is an issue, but in our state, for instance, uh, patients below the poverty line, the government gives us 15 lakhs for a heart transplant. Oh, they, give, uh, they give us 20 lakhs for a lung and I think close to 25 for a heart yeah, lung. So, that's, so that's funding is, is, I don't think 15 is necessarily enough for every patient, that's, but it's reasonably helps. generous. So. <laughs> Cost is just one part. In this part, it, we don't, it's not also just because the government gives us 15 lakhs in Tamil Nadu. We've got 10,000 patients waiting. So the awareness itself is. Um, sure. One <coughs> thing which we can, can't escape is in your post operative management, which is a key. How does the Indian social dynamics of the society and our pollution levels, our diarrhea, dysentery, water, availability of clean water? You think our infection rates are a trouble yeah, for so you? When, when, we first, when we first started, uh, we, uh, we didn't know what to expect in terms of long-term survival. And uh, I'm astonished that now we've completed seven years and we have several patients who have got who have crossed five years. Our five-year survival rate is around 76%. It's no different from what is published in the literature. So actually, our incidence of late infections of, of tuberculosis or uh, other kinds of disease has not been high. Having said that, <coughs> survival is clearly better for patients who live in cities and who are from a more affluent socioeconomic class than those who come from lower strata and especially those who are in <coughs> unhygienic slum-like conditions. Because um, it's an undeniable fact of life uh, that <coughs> your social infrastructure where you live has a bearing on your health. That's not a necessarily a problem that medical personnel can solve. I mean, even if you had to provide free medicines, you can't give free housing for everyone. So that's something which will happen as the 
<laughs> overall economy of the country improves and maybe when we become a $5 trillion economy or $10 trillion in the next decade, the whole situation will change. So thank you. It was so nice to hear from you, sir. It's a pleasure, as always. Thank you.